can see my pants. Doesn't matter. Mm -mm, doesn't matter. <laughs> Literally nothing matters. I've never committed to anything in my life. <laughs> Not even a full costume. I mean, I haven't committed to this lifestyle. I haven't committed to this life, and I can opt out anytime I want. Yeah. I tell my friends that all the time. I hope yeah. they worry about me. Yeah, I do worry about you. Actually, every day I do. Mm -hmm. That's the nicest thing anybody's ever yeah. said. Yeah, but not in like an overbearing kind of way. Just in a, I wonder how loosely Andy's hanging on today, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, I think of life as performance art, not, not serious. Yeah, I mean, well, some parts are kind of serious. Right, mm -hmm. like, can we talk about it? Dying. Yeah. Death. Yeah. It's it's pretty serious, but I don't I don't know how serious it is. I think I'm 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 loosening my grip on the seriousness of death every year. Yeah. Yeah. Ever since let's say it on three. One, two, three. Your my mom, mom died. died. <laughs> Love you, Mom. <laughs> Miss you, girl. Oh. Yeah, but you know but. what? <laughs> this is your grief. But you know what? This is this is um, this is why because like, I think death is this thing that happens to other people and not us. Mm -hmm. You know, throughout our lives. But then when it does happen to us, like not us, us, but like someone that's in intricately like you know just intertwined in your existence like your mom yeah you you can't help but have that that perception and that you know idea of death be eternally shifted yes because you've been there and back almost yeah you've had to watch it you've had to actually yeah. think about it yeah for most of us it's just a passing thought yeah it's like um, it's something that every once in a while is an intrusive thought if you're standing in the line at Publix or something. Right. You know, and they, they yeah. ring up your chicken and you're like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die one day. Rats. <laughs> but then how much was that watermelon? Yeah. Is the next thought, you know? Yeah, and like a lot of times for me it happens driving down the interstate, you know. Like, I could just die. Anybody could die anytime. Oh, yeah. Like we have these passing thoughts, but I think we're also constantly – trying to push them away from us, even if it's subconscious. So we don't allow it to really sit and like, we just don't give it, we don't give it space in our lives. Yeah. We're just always trying to move past that thought or that feeling or that fear, you know? Well, we don't think of, uh, why, we have a culture. Why am I holding my... <laughs> you regal, <laughs> darling. Death. Party. Death is merely a passing thought. <laughs> Let's make it classy, though. Yeah, death, but make it British. Yes, ladylike death only. Only. I'm gonna die th thinking gonna, of Britain. I'm gonna stop doing that now. Okay. I'm gonna hold it more like a. Yeah, but that this is like. That's almost like the way you cling to life. Sure. Just, just the by... way you cling to this mic. Right. Just barely, like I could just let go. You could. You could be like this. You could speak the whole time like this. What if I did? <clears throat> and this is what I think. <laughs> if we start doing this uh -huh. and not, if we didn't acknowledge it. Uh, but I think that you could almost, you can almost pull off anything if you just Are don't acknowledge enough. it. Yeah. Like if it's just. There's nothing to see here. I'm presenting my thoughts. This is me presenting my thoughts. Amen. Um, and this is the way I've chosen to do that, you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm serving it to you on a silver platter. Serving it. It's giving words. It's giving, it's giving thoughts. It's giving opinions. <laughs> Speaking of having something to say, what, did, what were we talking about? Um, my mom died. It was really sad. And now I'm friendly with death. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but you Passing said thoughts, something. You were saying, oh, well, it's because we have a culture that doesn't think of death as integral to life mm -hmm. um, or, like, doesn't think of it as the other side of a coin, really. Sure. That um, there's really nothing precious if, if life is not finite, then what is precious about it? Mm-hmm. You know? Right. 
at least this presentation, at least this iteration mm -hmm. of things, if you believed that, um, that's why the, the concept of the Christian heaven mm -hmm. never really appealed to me. Hey, what, well, what are we doing? I don't know. You want to change it up? <laughs> okay. My arm's getting tired anyway. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. <clears throat> um, yeah. the concept of the Christian heaven where it's just you, but you're like, on a cloud yeah was awful yeah to me because i thought that will really not be good for my brain the way it is now to just go somewhere where i'm just floating around sure. and like nothing crazy ever happens like yeah. not even bad sex or sure you know not i don't even get to like bitch about bad nana pudding mm -hmm. you know it yeah. sounds bad which you wouldn't think there would be a such thing but there is yes that's bad banana pudding there yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Well, you got my grandma one time had weevils in her vanilla wafers. So it was just like, yeah. That's a new level. Yeah. It is. I like cultures that s almost celebrate death. Yes. Um, yes. It used to be, you know, there was a time in history and within certain cultures where the grieving were really like revered and treated as almost holy. Yeah. Because. No matter, you know, what you believe, if you have any sort of spiritual belief, I think, like, witnessing the death of someone very intimate to you and walking through that entire experience seems like it would be the closest you can get in the earthly realm to your spiritual afterlife or yeah. your God. Yeah. And so, like, when you're in that that early grief that initial grief where it's this fresh like special kind of pain and mm -hmm. emptiness but like there's still like there's something sacred about it like mm -hmm. that that was my experience with my mom was like even in the in those moments like where you just you can't imagine yourself surviving that going through that you can't even think about it right but it was like in those in those moments something really spiritual happened you know um and my sister you know my sisters would say the same thing like unexpected peace unexpected um sort of like spiritual uh downloads kind of thing yeah um so it makes sense to me that it used to be you know the grieving were celebrated. They were revered. They were almost, you know, they were lifted up in their villages and communities. And there was like, you had three months to grieve, not three minutes like it is today. Yeah. It makes people really uncomfortable. And I don't think you can know. I think that's the shitty part of, mm. you know, being human and dealing with these hard things is like, until you have been through that, you really just don't, you can't have the empathy that you need to support somebody in that. Like you, you can, you can try, you can like learn try to learn like what is needed and like how to best do that. But it's like, yeah, I didn't know. I think I was an empathetic person before, but after mom died, it's just a different level because, oh, yeah. because then you just know, you know what it feels like when no one shows up after that. You, you know what it feels like when, when nobody asks. And it's like, even if we, don't want to talk about it like you know i'm sure i blazed in here and like sat down oh, and i'm like love. brandon but we, let's talk about it okay? yeah i'm here i'm all ears tell me everything and he's just like run Not get ready. away from me um but you do want people to, you at least want them to ask and then you can say no you know right yeah um also the more i hear about grief with a parent or somebody else's, you know, a sibling, a child, God forbid, but um, that people say, please don't ask what you can do. Like show up with food, um, just call me and tell me that you're thinking of me. Um, like show up mm -hmm. basically, I'm like make your way into somebody's life. Yeah. Well, when you're like in that deep grief, you don't even know what you need mm -hmm. and you don't have the energy to think about what you need, you know? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, don't ask what, what they need. Don't ask, don't even ask how you're doing. Just show, just show just up. Just show up. Or just call. Yeah. You know, it's like 
so very few people know how to do that. Um, yeah. But it is. It's just it's just uncomfortable. And it makes them have to look at death when well, they're in front of you. This you know? is the weird thing that we have here. We're simultaneously um, a culture of boundaries and no boundaries. And people are constantly talking about putting up healthy boundaries. But they're not talking about how to break walls down either, which yeah. is like communicating and being like, actually it's about risk taking. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about the possibility of me confronting someone that I'm really close to. Yeah. And it's just taboo for us to really address things. But I, I think that the people that are willing to um, do it, like almost transgress mm -hmm. And then be willing to learn from it if it really was a transgression, mm -hmm. and be like, "I'm sorry." Yeah. Maybe I made a maybe maybe I erred. I'm willing to learn, mm -hmm. and being like, if that person's willing to forgive. So anyway, I think people are so obsessed with not stepping on boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you have good intentions, you should at least try to make your way into somebody's life when you know they're hurting. For sure. For sure. I think people can use the excuse of respecting someone's privacy. There you go. Might be an excuse. You know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it can be an excuse of like, that's a private thing. And I don't know where that comes from. This whole like, you know, death and grieving, that's private. Mm. It actually didn't used to be that way. No. It used to be a very like community centered experience. Yes. They would have fucking parades and march through the streets. And yes. Hold feasts in the grieving pe family's honor and like yes. dress all in black and like bow down to them. And the whole community would show up at your house and like, it's just... It should be that. People, you know, people need people to survive death. Yeah. You know? We need people to witness our grief, too. Yes. We need people to, we talk about people there to witness our life. Mm -hmm. um, and we need people there to witness the grief that we go through, too, I believe. Um, and I will say that the culture that I was brought up in, and it is an Appalachian culture thing, but I will like even get more specific and say my family, because they were so faith-based, they were um, jovial about death, and it was almost like a, you die, you go, it's even better, actually. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. next realm that you go on to is better. They talked about death all the time. Mm -hmm. They talked about... Um, my grandma wanted to die so bad mm -hmm. because she wanted to go on and be with Jesus. But see, she had had a son die. Mm. I think she was she wanted to be reunited with him. Yeah. So I just remember growing up and like you go and do the th people were crying at funerals, but like they were always like shouting and screaming and praising and like somebody would like get saved. Yeah. Or you know, there was always like this altar call and and people were very um they took it they took the opportunity to be very spiritual and esoteric mm -hmm. and and think about what what a life means and what the next iteration might be mm -hmm. you know what what is what is the afterlife yeah and there was always like tons of food oh yeah Tons of food. Tons of food galore for days and days and days. You go to Grandma's house. So much food. So casserole much. after casserole. Casserole, casserole. Casserole, after. which I ain't got nothing against a casserole. I know you don't much care for casseroles. How do you remember that? I just remember you saying that at one point. Yeah, it's an excuse. I think I offered to bring you a casserole. And, and you, I turned it down. Well, you just you stated that it wasn't your preferred, you know, like... Format. Yeah, you said Thai or casserole, I think. I, I've tried to give you a casserole probably <laughs> a bunch of times. Well, you know what? If one showed up, if a, if a theoretical casserole showed up at my door, I wouldn't turn my nose up at sure. it. Sure. I'd eat it. Sure. But I think you, you just eat better than me a little bit, whereas I do. You think? I do. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I can't turn down a casserole. Yeah. If it's there, honey, I'm going to get in it. Like... I love a creamy, cheesy, noodly, ricey. Oh, I love that for you. You know when people say that, I love that. I love that for I you. I love that for you. <laughs> How's that working out? 
fun. Actually. Well, it's working out great I for don't, you. I actually don't need it. I haven't had a casserole in a long time. And honestly, might make one tonight. Yeah. What kind? You know, um, God, there's a real, real hillbilly recipe um, that is kind of like a mix between chicken spaghetti and... Um, <laughs> Yum. <laughs> TGI Fridays, here we come. Yes. Waff me, honey. Waff me up if you want some chicken spaghetti that, on a Friday night. Honey, that calls for a vodka sonic. Yeah, that's a vodka sonic night, baby. I'm going to put on the good panties. Um, <laughs> okay, no, that's actually, that's probably not, that's not what I would make. But I, d I do have an affinity for slightly disgusting, like, versions of food. Broccoli stuff. Yeah, I mean, With I cheese, broccoli with cheese on it. Love broccoli with cheese on it. Hate it. Hate it? Hate it. And I think that I've been turned away just because of the smell. Oh, it doesn't it's, smell good. No, it's uh, it's repulsive. Um, my niece eats broccoli, like very casually. She likes that raw broccoli. She she likes it steamed. Oh, me too. Now I love broccoli. I, just I mean, don't I love put broccoli that now cheese too. on it. But when I was a child, I had to have the cheese, or that wasn't getting in. Yeah. The popper, no way. But you still eat broccoli with cheese on no. it. No. Okay. But I, I will do like a roasted broccoli with some Parmesan. That's different somehow. And garlic. You know? Yeah. The cheese that's, that's like molten Think lava. Think about like cheese Whiz. <laughs> you know what's so funny is I'm acting really pretentious about this, but I will literally eat Tostitos fucking queso salsa stuff like right out the jar Same. from the four-way. I'll For go sure. over there and just Sometimes eat it. Sometimes you need it. Yeah, but something about putting broccoli. It's almost like you're trying to – anything that like poses as healthy. Sure. You know, you're anti. Like, don't hide. Don't mix. No, don't mix. You're I'm all for going segregating. All, all out. Yeah. Your vegetables. Segregate your vegetables, honey. Well, yeah. If you just clipped that first part. Yeah. I'm all about <laughs> segregation. segregation. With vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey. You know, how do we get on the veggies? I don't know. You said casseroles. Casseroles, casseroles death, yeah. food, always food at the yes. house. Yeah. So I think that there were I my culture growing up was that people were always present. I kind of relate to that. I mean, you know, also growing up in East Tennessee, very religious family. Everything was done as a family mm -hmm. and as a big group. Every event was a big communal thing, and. Um, yeah, every, we, we moved away from there when I was in high school. And it wasn't really ever the same as that, you know. And now when I go back, I always, I'm, I'm a bit nostalgic for that oh, experience. Yeah. And so I love that. Um, but, yeah, you kind of go out into the world, and especially when you go and you're in different cities and, like, you just realize, oh, wow, not everybody will grew up like that. Not everybody is, like, Bobbing with even... It close to their family like it just becomes you know you just kind of navigate how you relate to the world from that experience yes. growing up yes in a different way I don't know if that makes sense but no it does it does it totally makes sense um I want you to give us a little taste of kind of the rabbit hole that you went down oh, after your mom passed away yeah. and then you um kind of did some some very esoteric uh digging oh yeah well as you would you know mm -hmm. i think for me so let's plug this so people don't think oh. we're drinking alcohol. blood yeah yeah well, no. sober sisters here sober sisters cheers yeah. this is uh this is curious elixirs number nine yeah not to be confused with love, love potion, potion number, number nine. nine no it's like a fizzy rosé it's got it's, it's adaptogens fun. and, you know, yeah. you feel, like, really happy. It feels good. Yeah, it's good. But it's also because we're talking about death. Exactly. We're just trying to brighten it up with that. Um, you know, I think when something like that happens, mm -hmm. my, at least my initial reaction, I mean, obviously there was the, you know, wanting to crawl into a hole for days and weeks and never come out and just 
you know, a lot of really deep, heavy grief for sure. But then there was also like this intense desire to just understand death. Like, where is she? Yeah. Where did she go? What did, what happened? Like, what did she experience? What did she see? What are all the different, like, ways that it could have gone down for mm-hmm. her, you know? So anyways, I mean, I, I, I came, I found this whole little corner of the internet that was all about near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. So they're called NDEs, and there are thousands and thousands of, like, documented accounts. You know, people have devoted entire lives to this research. And the interesting part about NDEs is that they have records of these experiences back to, like, ancient Greece, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, so I, like, came across this research, and I would just... For days, sometimes, Andy, I would binge these indie videos on YouTube. Yeah. And I still watch them sometimes because they're comforting to me. Um, They're comforting because they're all so similar. Mm. And that somehow is proof for me. Um, You know, that... Well, enough people corroborate a story, you're like... It's it just be feels comforting that so many people have had this experience, you mm-hmm. know. But it's, yeah, they're, it's really, really interesting. So NDE, like the way that it's sort of classified in this world that I dove into is like someone who was clinically dead. There's no way they would have had brain activity. And they had this very vivid experience that was that felt very real that they could recount that mm-hmm. they never forgot that they still to this day can remember right yeah and so and and they're varying but like a lot of them are you know they start with the whole like out of body experience looking down at themselves and then there's usually like a a vastness that they enter whether that's through a tunnel or just being sucked up into the universe and then there's usually some like you know spiritual type beings that they encounter Mm. and usually their perception of who and what that is is oftentimes formed by their own spiritual beliefs on earth Mm -hmm. so some people you know are sure that they've met jesus some people are sure that they've met, you know, uh, Archang- Archangel Michael. Some people are sure that they're seeing their dead relatives. You know, there's all these different things. Some are just, you know, these are sort of spiritual, multidimensional beings. And there's no real religious, like, affiliation in their mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So these people, there's always that. And then always, I would say, like, nine out of ten times... They're always shown some sort of, like, review of their life. But the thing that they all say is that there's no sense of judgment. It's not like, this is what you did right, this is what you did wrong. Mm. It's like this crazy, like, simultaneous all of your life at once, like a movie in front of you, and you feel the emotion that you felt and the emotion of the people you were connecting with good and bad during those times, like instantly. Mm. And you just sort of understand everything. Right. All of a sudden. Right. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I've watched no doubt hundreds of these videos. Yeah. Because you just, like, it's just the one thing we don't know, right? It's like, what happens when we die? Yeah. And, yeah. What's been amazing to me is to hear, like, my grandma had... A couple different near-death experiences. One was when she had like heart surgery, and then the other one was, um, I think she had. She was always dying. She had like <laughs> a million heart attacks. She had. She had such a. She's a survivor. Screwy heart, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one, she saw her body. Like she came, she came out, and she saw her body there. And I think both times, one for sure, she kept trying to go toward the light. And she was told that she had to go back, and she really wanted to... She was so excited to go toward the light. But then she got further and further away from the light, and it said that she had to come back. It wasn't wasn't her time. Yeah, yeah. And 
And I remember that. I remember, like, I remember where we were, like, everybody was eating fried chicken and singing Will a Circle Be Unbroken and all that kind of stuff at her house while she was dying. And my aunt went up to her and was like, Mommy, I love you. You've been such a good mother. But I've got to go do Minnie's perm right now. (laughs) She was, like, saying bye. She was like, I she was she, grandma is dying and she has to go do this woman's perm. Oh, wow. But yeah. um so we all laugh about that now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it sounds like my grandma also had that experience and it is comforting to to think that people at the moment that they let go that they're wanting to let go because mm-hmm. they think there's something better that they're going to like that's what you want to know you want to know that there's there was no fear yeah in your loved one absolutely you know like in in all of these near-death experience videos there is always that moment where they are given the choice you know Mm. you can stay or you can go back and um they all want to stay they don't none of them want to come back to earth but then they're shown like their children or something that they're meant to do or whatever. And then they sort of like realize, okay, yeah, I need to come back because of this thing or, you know, I don't want my kids to go through this or whatever. So like, yeah, it's interesting to me to think about if that happened, you know, what my mom was shown that made her think that I would be okay. (laughs) Where is it, honey? Waiting on that. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I, I take comfort in that. Maybe she was shown her on like a breathing machine the rest of her sure. life. And she was. Yeah, thinking, she would definitely not want that. She's like, fuck that. Kristen no. can't do this and go be an artist. No, she would never want that experience. I mean, she was a fiercely independent person and she would never, you know, we would never do that to her. Um, but yeah, I think there's like. Sometimes when I'm, like, really feeling shitty about mm. my life, I'm like, well, <laughs> Mama said to hell with it. I ain't coming back. So she mu- there must be something Some good coming. Yeah. Like, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Like, I don't think she would have just been like, yeah, peace out if, like, you know, I was just going to crumble into a, you know, paper bowl and, like, dissipate yeah. into the wind. Right. I don't know. But that would be cool if you did. It would be kind of cool. <laughs> I like that. I'm open, idea of really, you. to how it all manifests. Yeah, you know? I like you going out that way. Yeah. Um, well, your mom. I mean, your mom was fierce in her faith, mm-hmm. also. Yeah. So that. I mean, I kind of wonder if at the end, it's it's weird. <clears throat> okay. I'm getting a little off track here, but I think for all intents and purposes, I don't believe that we go on as individuals. I believe, I have a friend, Judy, that said it really well, and she's like a, she's a very fierce Christian, but she believes that like our essence that was God returns to God. Yeah. And that's kind of what I think. It's like, I... I, I believe that we actually have to, that moment that we die is surrendering this identity of I mm. and that it goes back to its source almost. Yeah. And that that source, it never goes away. It's like constantly replenished. Um, and I don't know why. It's not just that that's comforting to me. It's that there are times when I truly... I mean, sometimes it's frightening, sometimes it's comforting. But there are some times when I truly don't feel that I'm separate from everything that is around me. I mean, I know I have this skin and I know that I have a body and those are like, those are parameters. But like everything, for instance, you appear Mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. So in a way... My mind is integral to your existence. And everything actually is just consciousness. Like Mm -hmm. you appear, everything that's happening right now is appearing in your field of awareness. Even your feeling of being a self is occurring in the same 
space. Yeah. And it's kind of like everything is consciousness. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah. And all of that stuff. Um, like even Cody and I were talking the other day and it was like, even when you're watching a movie, sometimes you'll, I'll become very aware of the fact that like, oh, this is just light refracted off of an object that my brain perceives. Like nothing is not filtered through through perception, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes that trips you out because you're like, is there objective reality? Yeah. But it can't really freak you out because you're like, everything that I, has ever been experienced, everything that I've ever experienced is through that lens. Mm -hmm. and, and in that way, like I'll never know death. Only other people will know that I died. Yeah. But I'll never know death. Yeah. I'll only know life. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe consciousness doesn't cease. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's the great mystery, It right? is the great mystery. <laughs> That's why I don't do away with anything, because yeah. I don't really know anything. We don't know it's anything. It's like the great, it's like the, the last frontier. Yeah. The only unexplored element of humanity is actually death, because... You can't go all the way there and come back, you know? Yeah. So these, like, little glimpses from these NDEs are fascinating to me. Because yeah. Because I just am so fascinated by the unknown. I'm so fascinated by, like, how far can our consciousness reach? Yeah. How, how you know, and, and, and um, you know, the big takeaway, too, from all that is the way that people describe feeling the difference between that experience and a dream or an hallucination which a lot of people you know try and argue that that's what it is like the final throes of your brain waves trying to create some sort of like vivid imagery and everyone discredits that by saying i felt more aware Alive. yeah i felt completely more aware than is yes in my human it was like everything was on 20 from my perception to my senses to my personality, everything was intact. It wasn't yeah. like I was just this sort of, you know, uh, monolith, you know. Yeah. It wasn't just I became this very flat thing. It was like I was very much myself. I was very yeah. much in embodied. I think it's interesting what you said about the brain right there mm -hmm. because um, – Emily Dickinson has a poem that the brain is bigger than the sky mm -hmm. because the brain contains the sky, actually. Yeah. Is that the wheel one? I, I, I almost want to read it. Can I get my yeah, phone so we please. can read it? I mean, it's Emily Dickinson, so I feel like we I can. I think it might be the wheel. There's a, there's a line in there about the wheel. Maybe so. Maybe. I'm good. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain, with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them, blue to blue. The one the other will absorb, as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Emily, let's just give her a round of applause. You know, honey. Can you hear that? I think she can. Hey, darlings, if you're seeing this, it's probably because you're not subscribed to the Patreon, and I'm going to need you to fix that because Mama's got bills to pay, okay? I got Slim Jims to buy. I got big mountain woman things to do. We got three tiers, and you can join today for just a dollar. I got everything from vlogs to full episodes of the Hillbilly Pygmalion podcast, character interviews, and much, much, much more. Join today and become a true shit ass. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash Andy Marie. That's www.patreon.com forward slash A-N-D-I-M-A-R-I-E.